All right, so we're going to cover an introduction to a topic called Brownian motion, which a lot of times in the financial um, textbooks ends up being also called Wiener processes. But anyway, just want to go over some definitions. A process is a process is an event that evolves over time in attending, <coughs> intending to achieve a goal. Okay, processes generally start at time equals zero and end at time equals capital T. It's a typical notation of this. During the time an event may, at various points along the way, have an effect on the eventual outcome of the event. For example, a baseball game. A baseball game happens over time. Let's say the innings are individual events that get added up to complete the process. It is possible that the score from, you know, in a baseball game, the previous scores get added to the score of the current inning to get the next score. But it doesn't, for a process, it doesn't have to look at the past. So a process is basically a very vague concept. It's just something that evolves over time and eventually is trying to achieve a goal. A stochastic process is a process which can be described by a change in some random variable over time, which is either discrete or continuous. So an example of a stochastic process could be, I don't know if you've ever seen questions in uh, probability theory where like you're trying to predict today's weather and they say based on the last three days you put a weight on each of those and it'll tell you whether it will rain or not rain today. I don't know if you've ever had a, a question like that. But basically the whether it rains or doesn't rain just keeps evolving over time and then you want to see um, at a certain, you'd be asked a question like at a certain point in time, what's the chance it would be raining or not raining? <clears throat> so the process just counts on a random variable to figure out what its current value is. So that's a pretty vague uh, concept. Stochastic process. Okay, now in probability, this is a famous cliche problem called a random walk. A random walk is a stochastic process that starts off with a score of zero. And then at fixed points in times, the same interval between each of the fixed points in times, discrete events, uh, there's a probability P that you will increase by, your score will increase by 1, and a probability 1 minus P, your score will decrease by 1. And then this will happen, this event will happen T times, and then the walk is finished. So one, example, one question might be, what is the expected value of your walk? Well, you're starting off at 0. So you're starting off at zero, and then t times you're going to, with probability p, go up by one, and probability one minus p, you're going to go down by one. So whatever that adds up to, that's where you expect to be. So for example, if the probability was 50% chance you'd go up by one and 50% chance you'd go down by one, each time an event occurs, your expected gain would be zero. Right? So you start off at zero, you're expected to end at zero. If there was a 75% chance you would go up by one and a 25% chance you'd go down by one, then your expected gain would be a half. Right? You'll either go up 75 or down by one. So half the time you would go, I'm sorry, 75% chance you'd go up by one. 75 times 1.75. Yeah, your gain would be a half. So each time you're expected to increment by a half. So where do you expect to be? Capital T units away, T over 2. So if, if, this, if you did this 20 times, you'd expect to be at 10 in a case like that. Okay, and again, random walks are discrete. Discrete intervals, like maybe it happens once every day or once every second, but the amount of time is going to be the same. <coughs> okay, again, we're still on... Definitions. A Markov process is a, so again, a process is something that evolves over time. A Markov process is a process of a particular type of stochastic process where only the present value and a of a variable is relevant for predicting the future. So an example of something that's not a Markov process is if, if you did have one of those examples where you look at the last three days, tell, can the, the weather for the last three days predicts the weather for tomorrow. That's not a Markov process because all you have to see is your current state, today's weather, to be able to predict tomorrow's weather. Yeah. You don't have to go back into the past to figure out um, where you are currently. So, 
Um, so that's a Markov process. And then uh, the history of the variable and the way that the present value merge of the past are irrelevant. Okay. Now, a martingale process, hopefully we're near the end of uh, going over definitions, but a martingale process, um, a martingale process is a stochastic process where at any point in time t, the expected value of the final, the, the expected final value equals whatever the current value is. So let's say, for example, you had a random walk. And the random walk after, let's say it's supposed to run for 20 time intervals. And after 14 time intervals, the current value is 4. Then the final value is expected to also be 4. So what this is basically saying is, at any point in time, you could randomly pick a point in time and say, from that point until the end, I expect to see no change. So what would that actually mean about the probability of what's come, the events that are coming up? The upcoming events have an expected gain of zero. They're not expected to go up, not expected to go down. So, for example, if you had a Montingale process, like a random walk, you start at zero and you start going up or down, up or down, you eventually get to minus four. And then you said, what do I expect it to be when this thing eventually ends? If it hit minus four at some intermediate point, if you said, well, I expect it to be minus 4, I don't expect to be a positive or negative change from this point on. That would be a Martingale process. So does that make sense? That, that at a process that basically says, this notation is basically saying, at a point t along the way, the current value is x, so where do you expect it to be when it finishes? Well, I expect it to be x. Because I don't think anything that's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen in the future has no expected gain or loss. And all martingales by nature are Markovian. So again, Markovian means you don't need to see the past of how it got to x. All you need to know is it's currently at x and it's expected to stay at that. Okay. So this is something I just did in MATLAB. This is a, a tool. Uh, we can use to kind of generate or simulate things we're doing. So I basically coded up in MATLAB. I started with a value of zero, and then at each time interval, and I did 100 time intervals, but I basically said at each time interval, I'm going to, e uh, you know, I, I simulated a coin being tossed that had a 50% chance of being heads and a 50% chance of being tails. If a heads came out, I incremented my score by one, and if a tails came out, I decremented my score by one and then just let it run a hundred times. And then each time I let it run, I change the color of the random walk. So for example, the blue random walk went like this. Looks like there were two blue random walks. Oh, it must, yeah, it must have done two blue random walks. So then it went like along this path and eventually ended up down here. And then, for example, this yellow random walk went like this. Now, if at any point in time, so a, a random walk is by nature a martingale. At any point in time, let's say for example I started at 1 and this yellow one went along here. So here it had a nice streak of head, head, head and then eventually one tail's head. But let's say at this point, at this point in time, it looks like I'm at about 8 or 9. My score right now is at 8 or 9. If you are asked, where do you expect to be when we hit time equals 100? Right now, at time equals 60. After 60 coin flips, I was at plus 8. Right? About plus, yeah, it looks like about plus 8. Where would you expect me to be at time equals 100? If, I, if the only piece of information I'm telling you is at 60, I was at plus 8. Where would you expect I'd be at 100? You'd expect me to stay at plus 8. I may go up, I may go down, but the chance I'll go up equals the chance I'll go down, I should expect to stay at 8. And then what you might see in uh, the textbook, it says that it uses this term of filtration. So it basically says the definition of a martingale 
is a process who, based on a current value and a current filtration, you can expect the future value to be exactly the same as the current value. And what we basically mean by a filtration is this. Suppose I told you, suppose I let this run to time equals 60. And at time equals 60, the value is 8. But suppose I also told you, at time equals 40, the value was 3. And at time equals 20, the value was 4. Suppose I gave you three pieces of information. What the value was at time 20, what the value was at time 40, and what the value was at time 60. With all three of those pieces of information, if I said, what do you expect it to be at 100, what thinking would you do? If it's a martingale, the value at 20 and the value at 40 really don't matter. It's the most recent piece of news. Just to, basically, you're filtering out the not, not needed pieces of news, and you're just taking the most recent one and saying, well, okay, if you're telling me at time 20 the value was 4, at time 40 the value was 3, and at time 60 the value was 8, and with those three pieces of information, you're asking me to predict what will its value be at 100. I'm going to ignore 20 and 40. I'm just going to take the most recent piece of news and say, since this is a martingale, its expected value at any going into any future is it, it is expected to not change. So I would just say, OK, then if, if at point 60 the value was 8, I expect it to finish at 8. That's a martingale. OK. So this is just a, uh, a set of what they call sample paths of a random walk. So a random walk is a probabilistic thing. It has no, you know, it's a, it's a random process. Each time you alter the score by whatever the random event was, and you just keep a running total. So each one of these lines is called a sample path of a random walk. So you see that a lot in the textbooks. They'll go over sample paths. And <coughs> Okay, so now a formal definition of a Brownian motion, and what I'm going to do in a couple of slides is basically take a, a random walk and convert it into a Brownian motion. But the formal definition of a Brownian motion is a stochastic process. So all these things we're defining tonight are processes. They happen over time. A stochastic process, and it's popularly used the letter W. W, you would think you would use B, but some books use B for Brownian and some use W for uh, Wiener. Um, but it's a process that happens over time from zero off to infinity. It's a standard Brownian motion if, number one, it starts off at zero. So just like the random walk, we could have made it start anywhere, but we decided to start it at zero. It has continuous sample paths, so the random walk doesn't have continuous sample paths. It, it has discrete points where the value jumps. And actually in the, in the Mat, MATLAB uh, diagram I drew, it was actually drawing an angle to get from one point to the other. It actually should have just put dots at each of the points and let your mind connect the dots, but it actually drew a line between them. But this is a conti has continuous sample paths and it's, it has independently normally distributed increments. So this, the random walk had a uniformly distributed increment. They either had a 50% chance of going up or a 50% chance of going down. This one, as we go from one value to the next one, the way the, what we use to get to the next one is we run a ran, a, I'm sorry, a normally distributed variable and see what its result is and then add that to the current score. So the random walk is again, we start off with a current score of zero. We then have a random event occur that has a 50% chance of going up and a 50% chance of going down and take that outcome and add it to our current score. And we just kept doing that until we got to the end of time. In this case, we're going to take our current score, which starts off at zero, run a normally distributed random variable, add that result to our current score, and that gives us our next score. And we will do that until we, until we hit capital T. Now, unlike the random walk where we go, where the time between each random event is discreetly scheduled, these happen instantaneously. So when one happens, the next one happens instantaneously after that. And if you remember from the central limit theorem, 
adding together a bunch of uh, variables with pretty much any distribution will add together and become a normally distributed uh, process. Okay, so this ends up being kind of a formal definition, <coughs> and shortly we'll talk about how to build one from a random walk. But what's going to happen a lot with our, with our textbooks and just in this field, a Brownian motion, which we said was a process, and it was uh, Brownian motion was named after a, a uh, kind of like a, a botanist, like a who's people who study plants. What do they call? Botanist. Okay, so he was a botanist from maybe 150, 200 years ago, and he was kind of studying like when pollen falls in a lake. How, how long does it take to move around the lake? And it was kind of like where is its current location? Well, it's it's, its current location plus a normally distributed variable will give you its next location. I was kind of studying that. And so that's why a lot of the older textbooks refer to this as a Brownian motion, this type of process. And then there was a mathematician, I yeah, there's a mathematician, but a, a uh, famous person by the name of Wiener, I think, uh, I think I was reading he like finished college when he was 11. And, finished a PhD at Harvard when he was like 17, but I forget if it was in math, but he ended up making big contributions to mathematics. And so this is sometimes referred to as a Wiener process. So Browning motion and Wiener process, you'll see in the literature, end up, for the most part, meaning the same thing. But a Wiener process is basically a, uh, a process characterized by three facts, like the Browning motion, it starts over zero. In this case, it has almost continuous simple, uh, sample paths. Brownian motion said it had to have simple um, sample paths. This one allows for us to have two points in time, time t and time s. The gap between those two could be normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of t minus s. So this kind of opens the door between bridging the Brownian motion and kind of that random walk and saying the two can be somewhat similar if the gaps between the event got really, really small, and there were many, many gaps. So as, as the size of the gaps go to zero, a random walk starts to become a Brownian motion. And a Wiener process could be somewhere between the two. Kind of opens the door that it could be somewhere between these two. But as far as our textbook is concerned, um, and kind of this field is concerned, Brownian motions and Wiener processes can be um, can be considered the same thing. Okay, and that's why actually a lot, of, a lot of the definitions said a Brownian motion is a process W of T, and the W ends up being come, coming from the name Wiener. So you might see in the textbook, they might describe a Brownian motion and use the word, or use the letter W to symbolize it. And then if you want, we could have many dimensional Brownian motions. We could have a vector of uh, Brownian motions. And it's an n-dimensional Brownian motion if each of the w's, which is the <laughs> Brownian motion process, um, is a standard Brownian motion and are all independent of each other. So that's a definition that will just pop up later on. Okay, so now what we're going to just try to do is convert the random walk into a Brownian motion. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so if we took a random walk, and instead of doing like we did originally, where I said uh, every time interval, let's say you know there's a there's a a gap of time capital T, and then they're broken up into little small t time intervals, discrete time intervals. Instead of saying that the next event, the thing we're going to add to our current score, instead of that being a uniformly distributed variable, 50% chance plus one, 50% chance minus one. I'm going to say it's a randomly, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be a normally distributed next event with a mean of zero. Okay, now suppose we decided, so first change we're making to the random walk is we're saying the thing we're adding to our current score is normally distributed, not uniformly distributed. The second thing I want to do is to take the interval, each of the intervals, little t, that we add or subtract to our score, 
I want to divide that up into n equal parts, some number n. Now obviously we know from continuous mathematics we're going to eventually let n go off to infinity and see what happens. That's the way calculus works. Okay, so each of the increments, if we take what used to be our only increment, which happens at time t, and now divide that up into n intervals, each of our increments will add this much to our would have expected to be add this much to our uh, score. And the total increment, SI, would equal the sum of all of these uh, residual increments. The expected value of all of them added up, since this is a martingale, would be zero. The expected value of each of the increments would be zero. Actually, I probably should have broken I should have wrote these the other way around. This is the individual ones adding up, and this is the sum of all of these. It would be expected to be equal to zero. The expected value for r squared, since ri is equal to, we're letting this be the square root of t over n, for it to be a normal, uh, normally distributed variable, r squared is expected to be t over n. So the expected value for the increment would be zero, but the expected value for the variable squared would be t over n. Okay, and then we have the expected value. So now we're going to start to calculate, we're going to start heading in the direction of calculating the variance. So this, uh, of course this is a, a Wiener process or a uh, Brownian motion, it's a Martingale process. At any point in time the expected increase would be zero. But we want to calculate we want to start heading towards calculating the variance. So the value of s squared, because it's the value of s squared minus the expected value of s, that whole thing squared, we use that to calculate the variance. The value of s squared would be equal to all of the increments, the value of s squared up to some point in time i would be all of the increments from 1 to i times itself, and then take the expected value of that. So this is going to end up having a lot of terms. This would be linear, but there would be a lot of terms. It would be R1 times R1 plus R1 times R2 plus R1 times R3. We go through that whole row. Then it would be R2 times R1, R2 then R2 times R2, R2 times R3, and so on. If we said that each of these individual bits, now that, now that we're taking the random walk and slicing them up into n parts, if we said each of those were independent of each other, then there would be no correlation between, any time i and j were not equal to each other, there'd be no correlation, so the expected value of any two random variables that have the same expected, uh, that both have an expected value of zero multiplied together would also be zero. So since i and j are not, any combination of i and j, as long as it's not the same one, or uncorrelated, the expected value of this times this would be zero. So a lot of the terms in this, we're trying to calculate s squared, you know, the expected value of s squared. A lot of these terms would get, end up getting zeroed out. The only ones that would survive would be the expected value of s squared would end up being r1. This is kind of a PowerPoint notation. These should be lined up, the one and the two on top of each other. But r, r1 squared plus, and we go all the way down to ri squared. So it would be i terms each having a value of t over n. So the expected value of s squared would end up being, for example, if we went as far as up, all the way up to n, would end up being n times t over n, which ends up being t. So the value of, the expected value of s squared would be t, the way we took the random walk and chopped it up into little pieces, and chopped it up into n pieces. It's expect, the expected value of s squared would be t. The expected value of s, the expected value of s with the squared on the outside would end up being zero, right? Because the expected value, it's a monogate, so its expected value would be zero. So the variance would end up being t minus zero, which ends up being t. So the, the variance of this process, and all we've done so far is we've taken a random walk and instead of it just being a fixed 
a set of fixed intervals with one result. We took those fixed intervals and cut them up into n individual equally sized pieces and had each of them add a uniform, uh, a, ran a normally distributed variable to those for each of the n pieces and we end up figuring out what its variance would be. So we know its expected value because it's a Montegale is zero. Its variance would end up being t. So now what we'd like to do, I think the next step should be yeah, to let n go to infinity. <coughs> so as we let n go to infinity, if we take a random walk and take each of the time intervals and cut them up into n equal slices, and then let n go to infinity, this is now a um, this is now going to be a random walk where every event happens immediately after the previous one. And we keep taking these really incredibly small increments or decrements, which are normally distributed, and add that to our current score. The expected value at the end of the process, as n goes off to infinity, we end up with a we're going to say now a different function, and that different function now becomes a Brownian motion. So we basically used instantaneous mathematics to go from a discrete scenario to a, to a continuous scenario. And this function, which we'll now call x of t, is called the Brownian motion that corresponds to the random walk if we let it slice up and let n go to infinity. Its expected value, once again, it is a... Um, it's a martingale, so its expected value is zero. A normally distributed uh, variable is, has a bell curve to it, so we're always adding something that has an expected value of zero to our current score. We expect our current score to stay the same. And the expected value of x squared ends up, like we said before, being t, which then also contributes to the variance of this. Okay, so then uh, note that a Brownian motion is Markovian, meaning all you have to know to know what its next value is, is its current value and what we're adding or subtracting from it. We don't need to know the history of how it got there. That makes it Markovian. It ends up being finite. Now that we let n go to infinity, this became a continuous variable. It is a martingale because its expected value from wherever it currently is, it is expected to not change and it is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of t. And okay, so where are we really going with this? So this is kind of the last thing we'll talk about today. Where is this really going? What's the point of this? <clears throat> Suppose we had a differential equation of this form. We're saying dx, the rate that some variable x changes, is equal to a dt plus b times the derivative of what we're now saying is a Brownian motion or a Wiener process. Okay, where a and b are constants. Okay, now, the dx equals a dt part, this part, let's say this, let's say this was not here. Pretend this part's not here, so it's just dx equals a dt. What would that integrate to? If you were solving that differential equation, what would that integrate into? That would turn into x equals a t plus some constant. So some initial value of x, and then we're going to add an a and a t. And t ends up, in, our, in this case, will end up being time. So this is basically saying, like, we'll start with some initial value, and then, depending on time, we'll just keep, whatever the time is, we'll add that many a's to the score. So what are we effectively doing here? We're taking some initial value and then making it go, assuming a is uh, positive, in finance it will be positive, but in any other thing it could be positive or negative but we'll say this is positive, we're going to take some initial score and then at times going to cause the value to go up. This is going to be kind of like the current stock price and then this would be maybe interest, an interest rate on it or something that, something that goes up over time. So we're going to say like the current price of something is equal to its initial price plus as time goes on its value somehow inflates, it inflates by A. 
if we wanted it to be a rate, I guess we'd have to say whatever x0 is, multiply that by, a, like r, this would end up, a would end up being rx0. So that would be like, for example, if we wanted to say that a stock price is, let's say a stock price is currently $100, and we want to model where is it going to go in the future. And suppose we said it's going to just be its current value plus interest. So it's not really stock, it's kind of like putting money in the bank. It would be the current price is equal to the initial price plus the initial price times some rate times time. So let's say it was initially $100 and the rate was 2%. You take 2% times 100, which is 2. Every time unit, maybe the time units could be years, every year you get an extra $2. So it would be like $100 times plus 2, plus 2, plus 2, something along those lines. So we could start using an equation, something like this, to model the value of something that grows over time. Yeah? So um, XO, that's, the, that's what its um, initial is, and then X is the current? Yeah, X would be the current. So this is some initial, uh, this is, so this is basically a modeling equation. So this is like what we initially started with. And then time causes us to add some value to it. Actually, A could be negative, which, which could make value go down, which could be in the case of you know, present value, future value, if it was going down. But what we're going to end up doing is we're going to say we're going to model the price of something by saying it's uh, whatever it initially started as. We're going to assume in the case of things going up with respect to interest, this, is, this part of the equation is going to be the interest part. The part where we say, okay, the more time we have, the more it goes up over time. So we'd have to let A be, or whatever we put in front of the T, something that models the interest based on whatever the current price is. Now that would model, this equation alone, without this piece, would model um, an amount of money that was growing at a very fixed rate with absolutely no volatility. There's no, it's just like putting money in the bank and getting guaranteed interest. What if we bought stock, which may go up, may go down, but has an expected increase rate? Like when you buy stock, you expect it to go up with the interest rate. But it might go much higher, it might go much lower, but you have an ex your expected value is it should at least compete with interest. If you're a risk-neutral minded person, it's got to at least compete with interest. So when we go to model it, when we say the rate of change of the stock, it should be equal to, two, it should have two components to it. It should have, and now this isn't, this is one thing I say before I say this, this is not the perfect model for a stock, but this is the most commonly used one. So we're saying the price changes, it has two components to it. Number one, we have something that models the interest rate, something that grows with time. A second component is just some variable part that could go up, could go down. And it's going to go up using, it's going to be a Wiener process which starts at zero and then may, might go up, might go down. And then we're going to multiply it by a magnitude and add that number to the constant rate going up to take a guess at where it would be at some point in the future. So this is the model we're going to be using. So the two components are, the first component is exact interest, and the second component is a Wiener process, which is just moving up and down as time goes on, and we're multiplying that by a factor B. What, it, what would the factor B be in the real world? So this is, the com this is the fixed component, and this is the variable that we might win, we might lose but we're going to map along the idea of, of an interest line and then maybe go up or down along that line on a, on a, based on a Wiener process. Why would we have a magnitude of that? One stock might vary a little bit and one stock might vary a lot and that magnitude would end up just being a bigger number for a, a highly variable stock. So a stock like Google might have a big number for B and a stock that doesn't change much like a soda company like Coca-Cola might not change much that might have a very low B. <clears throat> the Wiener process, Wiener process is always the same thing. Starts at zero and then just keeps adding instantaneous increments of a normally distributed variable. They all have the same magnitude. So if we want to make a stock seem more volatile than another, we just may 
we make B larger. And if the interest rates go up, we make A larger. So the A constant here controls the interest rate component of our predicting the stock. And the Wiener process multiplied by some magnitude gives a randomness to the stock, and the B makes the randomness either bigger or smaller. And so what we're going to do is take those two concepts, add these two components together, and then say this is what we're going to use to model the behavior of a stock. So the interest rate part will come from whatever the current interest rates are. We assume that whatever today's interest rate is, it's going to be the same a year from now if we're trying to figure out what the price is going to be a year from now. And we're going to make the assumption that the volatility of a stock from the past will match the volatility of the stock from the future, which is not always true. But that's the only thing we can do. We say the past volatility, we guess that's going to be the same for the future. So what we can now do is we could, using something like MATLAB, is we can program in all these numbers based on the current interest rate and the past volatility of a stock, and then say, here's what the stock might do, and let it run, do it like I did with those uh, random walks, let a bunch of sample paths run. It's going to be random. And then if we wanted to, so like I say, maybe I'll do uh, next class, I'll do a, a Brownian motion version of it. But when we did this, let's say instead of these being a bunch of random walks, suppose these were a bunch of uh, Brownian motions. If these were a bunch, I'm sorry, if these were, yeah, if these were a bunch of Brownian motions rather than a random walk, if we added an interest rate, we'd be taking all of these and slightly tilting them up. So they'd be going like in this direction, not, not out like a martingale, but they'd be going up on an angle. <coughs> and then we'd say, okay, the possible results based on the volatility of the stock, we would have, you know, a wide range. Less volatility, they'd be closer to the middle, but still angling up at the interest rate. And then if we wanted to say, what is the price of a stock option on this stock with, let's say, a call of this number, that means from this number and up, we get profits. From this number and down, we don't get anything. So we would take, we could run this experiment thousands of times, take all of the numbers above the strike price, take an average of them and say, that's what we think we're going to collect in the future, and then subtract interest or discount by interest back to today, and that's what we think the stock option would be worth. If we use that model, the equation we had before, to model the stock correctly, then run the experiment thousands of times, take a weighted average, we could guess what, the, what a stock option would be worth today. So this was kind of the, the groundwork of uh, the method that was used by Black and Scholl, Black Scholes and Martin, Morton, I think, came up with using this model and that equation by taking the, saying the price of the stock will be, take its current price, add, it, add constant interest to it, and then add a Wiener process with a magnitude of volatility based on the past to predict the future and then take, um, calculate an expected value for the coal price. So that's what we'll talk about next class. Uh, if you want to read up ahead, it's the Black Scholl, Black, there's two or three people, Black, Scholl, S-C-H-O-L-E-S, -E -S, and, and Morton. Sometimes that name shows up. And they won the Nobel Prize for this calculation, <laughs> how to calculate the price of all options. Won a Nobel Prize.